So today, as you've noticed, we've got Adrian Seabrook, who's going to be taking you through principles and processes of flight data monitoring. Um, just for, before that, my name is Heather Harding. I work at um, L3 Harris within the Flight Data Services Division as well. And I sort of work within the sales, commercial and marketing aspect. Now, over to Adrian. Thank you, Heather. Well, hello, everybody. Um, we, so it's going to be a, a fairly one way uh, presentation, this one. There is a, a, a question and answer panel that you'll have on your, on your screen somewhere. Um, please use that throughout the, the presentation if you want to answer uh, questions that I'm posing or if you've got questions for me and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll try and weave it magically into my presentation to, to answer your questions. But there will be a section at the end as well um, where, I'll, where I invite uh, in questions from all of you. But as uh, Heather says, this is the first of four training webinars that we've got as part of our online safety seminar this year. This one's about the principles and process of uh, flight data monitoring. So you may have heard about FDM, um, depending on where you, what part of the aviation industry you, you work in. Um, maybe you've seen an aspect of it and you want to know a little bit more. Maybe it's brand new to you and uh, you, you just want to understand the basics of what it's all about. So hopefully this session will answer those questions for you. Okay, so I'm going to start by uh, using a, an English adage, uh, a, a phrase that we've got of a, a, a picture uh, gives a thousand words. So this presentation is flight data monitoring in a thousand words. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. It should have changed to the next slide. So flight data monitoring in a thousand words. And to help me with my 1000 words, I'm going to use a picture. Okay. And the picture I'm going to choose is this one. Let's just wait a couple of seconds for everyone to get that onto their screens. Okay. So what do you see in this picture? It's quite an odd picture to start a presentation perhaps, but what do you see in this picture? So what I see is, well, it's a black and white picture. So that is probably gonna date it. It's a bit grainy as well. Um, we've got a policeman and we've got a young lad running away from him. The number in the background there, 156, that's the price of petrol per gallon. As this is a UK photo, this dates us to the early 1980s. So we've got a little bit of understanding of what this picture might be. Um, and those who are old enough may know what was going on in the UK in the early 80s as well. So we've got that background to, to what this picture might mean to us. But essentially, this is a policeman chasing a young lad uh, down the road. Now, the, the essence of, of flight data monitoring is measurements, taking measurements of things. So if this picture did represent flight data monitoring, we would take measurements and we would take measurements like the running speed of that gent at the front there. We could take a measurement of the running speed of the policeman. We could measure the distance between them on the pavement. And then we can do what we do quite a lot of in flight data monitoring, and that's we can create our own values, create our own measurements, derive them from other things that we've recorded. So if we've got their running speed and the distance between them, we can derive a closing speed. Is that policeman going to catch up with that young guy? Uh, and if he does, how far down the path are they going to be? And these are quite useful measurements for us. But can you see what I've done? If this was FDM, can you see what I've done wrong with it? Feel free to type in answers. I'll give you the answer in a minute. 
That's right. Yeah. So somebody's got it. So you're quite right. What I've done is I've already tainted the data with my preconceptions. So I kind of led you down that path a little bit there that I gave you all the background, what it might mean, the policeman chasing this bad guy, he's obviously done something wrong. So I've tainted the data already. I've taken my measurements, but I've overlaid my own assumptions onto that data. And we've got to be really careful that we don't do this in flight data monitoring because I don't know that that guy's done anything wrong. For all I might know, there's been some kind of accident and they're both running to help. So the context of the picture is completely lost. I don't know what's happening here. All I've got is my measurements. We've got to be really careful in flight data monitoring that we don't taint the data. We let the data speak to us about the facts and we can only add to that with verifiable truths. Okay. Move to the next slide. So flight data monitoring uh, can have variable focus. You can have variable focus with flight data monitoring. You can look at annual statistics. You can focus right down to sub-second, uh, you know, momentary occurrences. Uh, and all of the time, we, we have to be careful that we don't add our own interpretation into that, that the data speaks for itself. We can add extra things into the data, like air safety reports or whatever, um, but the data must speak for itself. So I thought I'd just uh, introduce the subject with that. But what I'd like to do next is um, really go back to the, to the principles of, of flight data monitoring. And so we're going to have a look at some of the hardware. And here we go. So what is that? that I'm showing on the screen there. What is that? Should be fairly obvious. Yeah, it's got it written on it, hasn't it? It's the, it that's the flight data recorder. That's the black box. Um, bright orange, as you can see. Yeah, thank you. Anonymous attending. Got it right. Yes, thank you. Um, do you know what that gold tube is on the side? Is you're just typing away, perhaps. Well, I can let you into a secret. That gold tube is the underwater locator beacon. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, David. Yeah, so that's the the underwater locator beacon. This is the black box, the crash recorder. You might hear it uh, called. This is the thing that is recording the flight data on our aircraft and if our aircraft suffers a, a crash and that black box ends up in the sea for example we need to be able to find it again so that gold tube is the under and that will ping for at least 30 days modern ones 60 days uh, this little distress call um, so that we can find it. Because flight data monitoring has arisen out of the need to understand what was. So we've invented this. I can show you some of the tests that it has to undergo. If I press the right button. There we go. So here are some of the tests of burnt in kerosene. It needs to be dunked in hydraulic fluid. It's crashed and it's hit because it needs to survive. It's like a USB stick. Some versions um, are integrated with cockpit voice recorder. Oh, well, that kind of size. Okay. 
So, how does it all work? Well, on our aeroplane, modern aeroplanes are absolutely jammed full of electronic gadgets. Busy measuring things, testing things, monitoring things, computers doing all, all sorts of things. And those, those data signals are flying upwards and downwards, the, the electrical spine, if you like, of this aircraft. So what we can do is we can tap into that data flow and send all of our uh, signals into another box called a data acquisition unit. So there are a lot of acronyms in, uh, in aviation in particular, and DAU is one that you might come across in avionics, the data acquisition unit. So what this box does is it takes in all of those inputs from the same particular order. Okay. And then it sends it in one stream down to the FDR, the flight data recorder. The FDR is not clever in any way, it's not a smart piece of kit it just receives that stream of information being sent to it and typically it will, will uh, store that information in a 25 hour rolling loop so it's constantly overwriting itself But if that flow is ever interrupted, there's a crash, then you will always have 25 hours preceding that point of your investigation. The model particular to your to your aircraft but that's essentially the the data flow so where are these things placed in the aircraft well there's our fdr it's typically in the tail of the aircraft uh, it's a bit uncomfortable but it's essentially using the whole aircraft as a crumple zone so that the flight data recorder survives the uh, an accident data acquisition unit you can see all of the cables that might uh, connect onto that. Um, uh, somewhere in the avionics bay, you'll find that, that box. And then the QAR itself, usually around the cockpit area. Now that QAR there, that's an L3 micro QAR, and you can see that it has a little uh, USB port on the side. I'll see if I'll get my pen out to highlight um, what I'm talking about here. Now, little USB port here, um, mini USB port, so you could take your laptop up to this uh, QAR and, and plug it in with a cable to extract the data from it. Or it might have a little data card that sits in the top that you would take out and put into a card reader. Or this could be a wireless QAR. And when your aircraft comes back to base, it will get a, a, essentially a mobile phone signal and it will transmit the data to a base station where it can then be routed to, to us. But that's how, it, that's how it works. So there's any questions on that bit so far on the, on the hardware? Wait a couple of seconds to see if anyone's got any questions. No, that's all okay. Okay, fine, thank you. So we'll move on. And we'll move on. There we go. So we now have to need to look at the things that things that are being recorded by this by this aircraft. And there are, or there could be hundreds, it could be a couple of thousand different things that this aircraft is recording. And they're going to be things like heading and airspeed and engine speed pressures and you know pitch and roll and all of those kind of things so i've just listed a, a few of the obvious ones here but 
when these things are recorded, they're recorded in binary format. These are all noughts and ones being coming off the aircraft and being recorded. So we need some way of converting that into something that, that means something to us. There we go, like that. So our heading gets converted into degrees and airspeed in knots and those kind of things. And that conversion process happens right at the beginning of, a, of your, your service contract with us. Um, I, I believe everybody on this call at the moment is a customer, so you have gone through this um, as part of the process. Another acronym, LFL. So when we first sign you up for an FDM service, the thing that we need is the LFL, the logical frame layout. This is a document that comes with your aircraft, and it talks about the DAU. Do you remember the DAU from a few slides ago? The data acquisition unit, the thing that is sequencing the data. Well, the logical frame layout tells us what that sequence is. It tells us where the parameters are, how they're stored in that data stream, where, where, literally where they're positioned in that data stream. But it also tells us how we convert that into the engineering units. So for example, it would say, oh, heading, well, that's the, the first seven uh, binary digits and you multiply it by six and add five and it becomes, um, you know, heading in, heading in degrees. And that job is done by the data specialists, headed up by Andrew Boardman. Um, so you would have gone through that process of, of having your, your data decoded and when we decode it, that's what we call the data frame. So your aircraft has a data frame. It's the, the way that we decode it and decrypt your data and turn it into something that we can read. And once we've done that, and we have a nice load of sample data to, to work with, we can check that we've done the job right. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. So the first thing that we'll look at is pressure altitude. It's one of the, the four absolutely fundamental things that we have to have in FDM for it to work properly. We have to have altitude, we have to have heading, airspeed, and time. And time doesn't even need to be the time of day. It, as long as it's a linear sequencing of time, then that's fine. But we're looking at pressure altitude. It's the first thing that we'll uh, check and we're checking to see that we've got it scaled correctly because remember we're looking at this conversion if we get the conversion wrong we're going to get the scaling wrong so we're looking to see that this aircraft uh, it doesn't need to be at zero for takeoff obviously those pilots in the in the in the room will realize that it doesn't need to be zero pressure altitude to take off but we're looking to see that it's climbing to something sensible so in this case it's climbing to about 23,000 feet. That makes sense, that's about right. Uh, it, I wouldn't guess that that was half scaled. 46,000 feet, maybe not. Um, and uh, similarly for the descent, uh, that looks about right, it's scaled about right. It, the time intervals look about right as well. So that's fine, that one passes. The other things that we can look at is uh, radout. So radout, will, we'd normally see it negative when the aircraft is on the ground. Radout is normally tuned so that uh, on coming into land, that the wheels of the aircraft, just as they touch the uh, runway, that's normally tuned to be zero. So by the time the aircraft has sunk down on the oleos and the compression, that we'd normally see negative three or four feet, and, and that's what we'd expect. Now, at this point, we can start to derive our own parameters. So the first one we derive is altitude AAL, above airfield level. And it works a bit like a QFE, that it shows a height above the airport. So when we're taking off, it shows the altitude above the, uh, the origin airport. And halfway through the flight, it will swap, switch, swap, switch to the altitude above the landing airport. 
Uh, and you can see that on the chart here. So we've got the, the blue line, which is rad out, gets to about 3000 feet and it will saturate normally because that's just the, if you like, the full scale deflection of the rad out box itself. But AAL, we can continue that up. We take the shape of rad out, blend it a little bit with pressure altitude, uh, knowledge of the elevation of the airports, and we can create AAL as a, as a parameter. So any questions on that bit? Is there anything that's not clear? I'll just wait a couple of seconds to see if people are typing away. No, okay. Okay, if you have got questions, remember there's a section at the end where I'll, I'll happily answer anything you've got. Okay, so we'll move on. So the next thing we'll look at is accelerations. Uh, three axes of acceleration. We've got the uppy downy one, the side to sidey one, and the, the fore and aft one. So the top chart here, this is altitude, this is give us a reference. So we've got this aircraft descending from 3000 feet to a touchdown about here. Uh, that's our altitude. And we can look at the three axes of acceleration. We can look at lateral acceleration, that's the side to side one, which we would expect to be based at zero. If your aircraft is, is just flying down on the approach, then that you wouldn't expect to see much lateral acceleration. So it's based at zero. And as we cast our eyes along this line here, we can see that there's not much at all. But at the point of touchdown here, we suddenly see a little kick in, in lateral acceleration. And that's as the aircraft is touching down, maybe it wasn't perfectly lined up to the runway, it was crabbing in due to a the crosswind perhaps, and as it touches down, it kind of rocks your aircraft straight. So you see a little bit of lateral acceleration there. The next chart down is longitudinal. So this is fore and aft along the aircraft, normally around uh, zero again, unless we are accelerating or decelerating. And as we look down this uh, line, let me just change to a draw. Um, so there's a section kind of between here and here where it's slightly below zero. So this aircraft is decelerating. Maybe that's where the gear came down, for example. And then not, not a lot happening until the point of touchdown where we get this big drop here. That's the initial shock of deceleration on touchdown. And then we get a period from here to about here where the we can really see the deceleration. This is probably uh, reverse thrust being deployed. And then the rest of the trace is generally well below zero to show that this aircraft is braking as it's going down the runway, as you would imagine. And then we can look at the third axis, which is normal acceleration. So can anybody explain to me why we call it normal acceleration and we don't call it vertical acceleration? Oh, let's see who knows their little bit of physics. Type it in the Q and A. We've got an answer. Why is it not vertical? Why is it normal acceleration? Anyone got an answer? I saw somebody put their hand up, but I've, I've lost that. Well, I'll put you out of suspense. So it's called normal acceleration. It's using the word normal to mean at 90 degrees to mathematical term. And the reason it's that is because our aircraft has got this tri-axis accelerometer on board, which is measuring the, the three axes of acceleration. Now, as my aircraft pitches up, my uppy downy acceleration is no longer vertical. 
but it's still at 90 degrees to the airframe. So it's to do with the airframe, the pitching up of the aircraft. It's normal to the aircraft. It's not a vertical acceleration. We can derive vertical by a little bit of trigonometry, but it's a, it's a normal acceleration. Okay, move on. That button doesn't work. That button doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> Inconsistent performance. Come on. There we go. Okay. Uh, the next parameters, <coughs> excuse me, the next parameters we can have a look at are parameters that correlate to one another. So when one of them changes, it's going to affect something else. So roll and heading are the obvious pair here. When an aircraft is rolling, you're going to be changing your heading. So on the graphs we've got here, uh, we've got roll at the top here and negative roll the convention is a negative roll will be a roll to the left. Okay, so as we look along the graph, we have it's about zero, and then all of a sudden we have this big drop here down to about what's that about minus 23, something around there. So that's a 23 degree bank to the left. So what would we expect to see on our heading? Well, if we're banking to the left, we would expect to see our heading decrease. So we look at the heading chart here, and we're starting off here, which is about, what's that, 045. And when we get our left turn, our heading is decreasing. So this has been coded the correct way round. Sometimes we see aircraft has been reversed, and literally you can have these sensors the wrong way round, and it plugged in the wrong way round, and a left turn increases the heading, which of course is wrong, but we'll spot it. That's exactly why we're doing this check. So here's a bit of a trick question. On the right hand side of the graph here, we've got very little roll, but we've got a huge change in heading. Why would this aircraft have no roll, but a very large change of heading? Is my data broken? Put your answers in the box. What do you think? It's on ground. You're exactly right. Whoever that was, I didn't see your name there, but thank you. Yeah, exactly. The aircraft is on the ground. And there's a good point here because we're talking about flight data monitoring, but actually, as soon as that battery switch is on, this thing is recording. So being on ground is all part of the flight data monitoring uh, capture, if you like. So normally we wouldn't quite capture your first engine start, but we would capture your second engine start, we would capture, capture uh, pushback, taxiing out, obviously the flight itself, but the landing, the taxi in, and the return to stand is all fair game in flight data monitoring. Very good, okay, let's move on. So a quick note about heading. Now, for those who are not used to seeing flight data monitoring, uh, the data presented in charts and you know, graphs and tabular data, it can, it can look a little, little bit confusing. I appreciate that. But when we're looking at heading, uh, of course our heading is normal compass degrees, naught to 360. So when you plot that onto a flat graph, you, you have, a, have a chart like this. So the chart is increasing, the heading is increasing. Of course it gets to 360, it's gone through north and it goes back to zero again. So it does look a little bit confusing, but that is just an aircraft turning through north. So in this case, it's turning right through north and again left turn through north. Okay. So, it just explains what you're what you can see there. Okay. Oh my goodness me. Something's clearly gone wrong with my slide here. Wow. Nice. Interesting. Now, 
Uh, please excuse the squiggles. I can try and remove those. Right, okay, there we go. Now, the next thing that we need to look at is sample rate and quantization, which sound really boring, but they're quite important. The graph I've put up on the screen there is the air temperature as it changes through the morning. Okay, so there's the, the, the weather today is lovely. If I wanted to recreate that as an experiment, I would need to ch choose two things. Is it going to be every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes throughout the morning? And then when I take my samples, I need to choose what my measurement steps are going to be. Am I going to measure in half degrees, as I've done here, a full degree, five degree steps? So that's the principle of sample rate and quantization. So my results like this. So I've taken some the sample one two decimal places of latitude as opposed to eight decimal places of latitude, and it's only recorded once every 10 seconds. And you can imagine, if you're looking at a visualization of an aircraft like that, then it's gonna be very kind of stilted corners. They're gonna be very sharp and edgy corners. You have a high sample rate, small quantization, then you can have a nice smooth uh, parameter line on your, on your biz. On your biz. Quick look at data cleansing. Um, we have some patented techniques actually um, on data cleansing. Because uh, the data is not perfect as it comes off your aircraft. Very often there's little, little glitchy bits in the data, little spikes, and we need to clear all of those out. So there's a few little things, I could, I could talk about it another day. Um, the data cleansing techniques that we have, it goes through a series of tests. If it fails any of the tests, we can smooth things or clean things or, or, or just remove it from the data entirely, depending on, on what the situation is. Okay, so that's the principle. That's the basics of, of, what, uh, of what FDM is. So now let's have a look at the process, the kind of practical, real hands-on from your point of view, what it looks like. So your aircraft is busy going flying, earning you lots of money, and it comes into land, we need to get the data off your aircraft. Now, depending on the, the setup of your hardware, that might be that we take the data card out of the QAR, or it's wireless, or you have to go up there with your laptop, as we said earlier. But let's say we take the data card out of your QAR, and you need to insert that into a data transfer unit another acronym, DTU, and that's the hardware or software solution that we can supply you uh, to get that aircraft data to us. It's transmitted securely to us, and that just takes a few minutes. I can't be specific on that because sometimes your data card will have a hundred flights on it. Sometimes it'll only have one. But to give you an idea, flight data is quite, we'll get about, one to two megabytes of data per flying hour. Okay, so it doesn't take long to get that to us. We receive the data and we create a backup and it's all archived and the data is processed. And by processed, I mean, we run it through our data frame. Remember right at the beginning where we were decoding and decrypting your data? Well, this is this is what happens that's how it gets processed and at that point you can log into the website and you can see your flight and that just takes four or five minutes four or five minutes from receipt of data to it being available to see on the website 
We're not talking about events yet, we'll come into that in a minute, but this is just seeing your flights on the, on the website. It's at this point that uh, my, my team of analysts can get involved. Uh, we'll look at exactly what an event means in a moment, um, but within a, a working day, the analysts will go through and if there's any occurrences uh, in your data that they will write some commentary about that. Okay. Let's have a quick look now at the sources of information. So, so far, what we've been talking about is the recorded flight data. And there can be anything from eight parameters, just eight single parameters recorded up to a couple of thousand. Um, modern Airbus A380, for example, 2,000 odd parameters. Things that, frankly, we will probably never need, um, but they're there. And if you can think of a clever use of some of those, then I'll be very glad to hear it. But that is the main source of the information about your flights. But we can also get in some information from the quick access recorder itself. So sometimes that has a knowledge of what aircraft it's attached to. Sometimes it has its own internal clock and we can use that information. If, they, if uh, date and time is not in the recorded flight data, we could use the quick access recorder uh, timestamp to, to help um, synchronize your data. But there are still several things that aren't recorded. We don't know who the pilots were. If uh, gross weight isn't recorded, then we won't know what your V-speeds are. We're gonna have to, have to estimate them. Uh, we don't know what your flight number is. These things are not recorded in the flight data and they're not recorded in the QAR. So what we do is we ask for a supplementary piece of information is called an, an achieved flight record. And you can supply this after you've known the, the flight has taken place. You can't give us this information before the flight has happened. It's an achieved flight record. The flight has already happened. And it contains things like um, uh, locations, runways, uh, weights if they're not recorded, flight numbers, pilot identities, those kinds of things. You don't need to know pilots' names, it can be a code, it can be their payroll number, um, things like that to, to maintain anonymity. Anything that you might want to refer to a flight. So if later down the line you want to do a report on all flights with a particular flight number, then if you've been giving us those numbers, then that's easy to run the report. Okay, we shall move on to the coverage then. So for every fleet, for every aircraft, we can create a coverage uh, matrix like this. We have aircraft names, uh, tail numbers on the left there, dates across the top, and we can count the numbers of flights that you've flown. But we can also compare that to the achieved flight records that you've been sending in. So if you tell us that a flight has happened uh, because you've sent in an AFR, but we haven't received the data yet, then we'll get an orange mark on this chart. Orange mark like that one. Except there's minus one there because you've told us that you've flown, but we've not got the data. Of course, it could be the other way around that we've got the data, but we don't have the achieved flight record and that will give us a blue mark. But if we get both, they'll match together and we'll get a green one like that. OK, and we can calculate all that up. So here we've got 1100 have been flown. We've got 1052 have been analysed and that gives us, oh, excuse me, drawing is a 95% coverage rate. Now your flight ops inspector is gonna be quite interested in that percentage. He's gonna to want to see that you've got a good coverage of your flights uh, under, F, under FDM. And this is how you can check what your, what your coverage is. Okay. 
any questions so far? No questions. There's no questions waiting for me. If there's no more questions, I can move on. Just take a little sip of drink, excuse me. Okay. Right, let's dive on them and go into events. An event. This is the main purpose of flight data monitoring is to detect things. So, so far we've measured things, but now we want to use those measurements. So an event is when, well you can read the description there, is an instance when the aircraft or an aircraft system is operated outside a limit. Sounds quite vague, but actually encompasses loads of different things. We could be talking about a manufacturer's limit. Rolls-Royce say those engines can't go any hotter than, you know, 1100 degrees centigrade that is an absolute limit because if it goes any hotter than that you need to do an inspection but it could be your sop you expect your pilots to fly in a particular way it could be a passenger comfort limit anything that you can say well i don't, I don't want it to go any more than this and we can create an event for that and the flight data monitoring will give you the what and the when looking at the data and, and working out what has happened, uh, but it's the operator's responsibility to find out why. So linking back to that first slide and the picture of the man running away from the policeman, we can't be subjective about this, you have to be objective. You can only use the data information, the data sources that are verified, and you can't put your assumptions onto it. But you can, there's lots of different sources of information to help you understand the why. You can look at air safety reports, other, other safety reports, health and safety reports, for example, um, to, to help you understand the, the why. Okay. So let's uh, take a look at some of the measurements that we can make and compare that to the real life world. So if we're looking at the flare technique of, a, of an airliner, you might in the real world have descriptions like this. So for the flare, you, you smoothly increase the pitch and for the touchdown, you should be doing this and a, a positive landing is better than uh, you know, it's floating beyond the touchdown zone. So we can now use FDM to look at the things that we can measure. And I suggest that they would be things like this. So for the flare, we can look at maximum minimum pitch. Uh, we can look at the duration of the flare and we can look at how, how, um, how positive that touchdown really was, how hard it was. So we now need a way to inspect the data. And we do that with a series of values that we can create. So we start off with the recorded parameters. These are the things that are coming off your aircraft, the recorded parameters. And in this case it's AAL, so that's a derived one. So we've got parameters, but to understand our touchdown technique, we need to be able to identify the part of the flight uh, of interest. So in this case, it's the flare. So how do we detect the flare? Well, we use KTIs. Key time instance is a moment in the data when something happened. So we could create a key time instance for the moment we're descending through 20 feet and a key time instance for touchdown. Between those two key time instances, we can create, we can call that a phase. We can call that the phase of flare. Okay, so now we've highlighted the piece of, piece of data that we're looking for. And we can now look at the other parameter that we're interested in. We're looking at pitch. And we can see how pitch is changing throughout the, the, that, that phase. And finally, we can take a measurement so our measurement is a KPV, a key point value, value on a, on a parameter. So that's our maximum pitch during the flare. Okay. 
And the great thing about flight data monitoring is that we will take these measurements, these KPV measurements, on every flight. So for every flight that you fly, we are literally taking hundreds and hundreds of measurements, which you can refer to uh, late, at a later time. So we've got our key point value, our what was the maximum pitch, 20 feet to touchdown, and we can plot that into a histogram. So a histogram is a, uh, a way of counting certain values of a parameter. So there's uh, probably 100, 100 flights worth of information here. This tells us um, what the maximum pitch was um, during the flare for, let's say, about the last 100 flights. And we can see that, if I get my drawing tool up again, that the, the, the tallest column in our histogram is this one here, uh, and that brings us out to around three and three quarter degrees. So that is the, the most common pitch during touchdown. There are some guys down here where the maximum pitch was between one and two degrees, and there's a couple of guys up here where the maximum pitch was up to six degrees. So it shows a nice spread of data there. Okay. I move swiftly onwards. Okay. Now we can also have different types of events. Um, we can have safety, maintenance, and fuel. So where we've got our, our histogram, I also go back actually, let me just explain because I missed a bit out on this slide here. So back to the key point values. So we can, we're taking all of these measurements and that's fine, so that's a key point value statistic. But what we need to do to turn that into an event is to add a threshold to it. So we need to draw a line, which I will do literally. We need to draw a line, oh, we need to draw a line to say five degrees is my cutoff value here. Below five, I'm, I'm not interested in this case. Above five, I want to know about it. So an event is a key point value that we've put a threshold on. That's all it is. A measurement, a key point value measurement that we put a threshold on, and that is an event. So that will help understand what my next slide is about, the three different types of events. So we can create events that looking at um, safety events. Well, there's a question. Let me see what this question is. Can you support us on getting these thresholds? Yes, absolutely we can. Um, when we first sign you up, we will give you a generic set of thresholds, uh, ones that we think will work for a typical operation, but there is no such thing as a typical operation. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you will have a, an analyst point of contact. That analyst uh, is trained to give you advice and guidance on setting thresholds. Absolutely, yes, we can help you with that. There's no charges, any, anything silly like that when it comes to setting up thresholds. It's, it's all, part of the, all part of the package. Three different types of events. Safety events looking at pilot actions. So we're looking at when the flap lever was moved by the pilot. We can look at maintenance events. So the flap lever has been moved, but what about the flap surfaces themselves? The flap surfaces um, roll in and out, uh, not exactly at the same time that the flap lever has moved. Flap lever moved 10 seconds later, the flaps are like fully retracted, for example. So we can look at the, the, the flap movements. We're looking at engine speeds and temperatures and all of those kind of things. Or we could look at fuel. So fuel efficient flying. If you leave the gear down after takeoff for too long, then it creates a lot of drag and is fuel inefficient. So we can have events that, that trigger that. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. 
we can have three severities, which basically just means that we have three thresholds for that KPV, a level one, two, and three. Uh, level one is the less severe up to the th level threes, which are the most severe. And we like to say that the level three is the action point. So there's no point triggering loads and loads of level threes if you're just going to discard them because they're flooding your office. It needs to be something that you're now going to take action on. If it's a maintenance event, then your level three action point would be what it says in the maintenance manual, you need to do an inspection or replace a, a component. If it's a, a safety level three, that's your action point. Or what we're going to do, okay, well, we could talk to the pilot, we could, um, you know, run some statistics. Is this a, a problem that we've got in our fleet? Is it a new set of crew that have come in? Are we trying to uh, transition a crew onto a different fleet and there's some kind of old habits? Those kind of things. Action point for level three. Level ones and twos are auto validated. So the the if you set in a sense the computer will decide is that number bigger than this one okay it's auto validated for those serious ones those level threes then they will be validated by an analyst one of the my team of analysts are all uh, all have aviation backgrounds all different areas of experience in aviation as well and they will use their judgment and they will look at that data and they will write some commentary only on the what and the when it's still your responsibility to find out the why but they will give you the the um the facts and the figures from the data so event number four um let's see if we can work out what this would look like in real life so we've got pitch on that top chart and we've got roll at the bottom chart so what does that look like? Well, let's work our way through it. So the first part of the, of the graph here, it's pitch, which is fairly flat. So it's zero, not doing much. And the corresponding chart in roll is not doing much. Okay, so we're, flat, we're straight and level as we enter whatever's going on here. Then the pitch comes up a little bit bit but nothing too significant but the thing that's really interesting is that massive big drop in pitch to minus 35 degrees At the same time that's happening we have a roll of 80 degrees a roll of 80 degrees so this is an extremely dramatic maneuver that's happening here so we have the pitch comes up and then it comes down and we have this massive roll of 80 degrees. So I can show you what the primary flight display would have looked like. It would have looked like a normal G of 2.5. So it's a helicopter. Again, because I'm a helicopter man. And it's a helicopter that was doing a, a very steep uh, turn like this up and across very low as well but you look at that primary flight display there incredible pull two and a half g in that turn okay one more and then we must move on so event number five here so you can see from the shaded blue area and the chart at the top that this is something that happened right at the very beginning of the data. And we have a chart of rad out this time in dark green and it's at zero. So this is happening on the ground. Uh, we also have ground speed in the light green. So this chart is ground speed here. So the aircraft is taxiing is on the ground and there's a little bit of ground speed. We have a little bit of engine information here. So a little bit of throttles to help us get around the corners. How do I know there are corners? Because our heading is increasing. Okay, so we're getting the picture. Aircraft on the ground, a little bit of throttles, turning corners. 
we stop about here in the data, everything looks okay. From this moment to the right of the graph, the throttles go forward, the ground speed increases, but then all of a sudden the ground speed drops back down again because the throttles have dropped back down. So this is an aborted takeoff. There's still lots of turning information as well. That'll be interesting to see that on a map, which we will have a look at in a minute. But we carry on further and further to the right until we get to this point. Now this point, the throttles go forwards, but this time they stay forwards. Back at the drawing there. And the ground speed continues away and our aircraft takes off. So that's a rejected takeoff, a classic rejected takeoff there. And we can plot that onto a, onto a map. So here we are, this is the airport and we can follow our aircraft out. Started on the apron here and it taxied out and did a little bit of backtracking and did a turn ready to start. And then the throttles went forwards and then they were quickly shut back off again and the aircraft did a turn and backtracked all the way again back to the to the, to the start of the runway and then they went for the takeoff again so i wonder what was in the data we can see something that would have caused this rejected takeoff and we can we can see it if i have a look at flaps i put flap on the top graph there and you can see there's no flap information on this side of the graph. So they hadn't set their flaps for takeoff. Okay, if I put my flight safety officer's hat on now, I'm thinking, okay, they hadn't set flap for their takeoff. That sounds like they were rushing. They weren't going through their checklists. Cockpit resource management issue, perhaps. Um, commercial pressures, perhaps. Okay. So they're the uh, examples of the events. And now we've got to try and put all of this information together with any supplementary information that we've got. So we can draw in air safety reports uh, and, and, and other reporting, but we can also use Polaris for supporting information for statistics. So we've got a wide range of statistics that we can create. It's easy to create. You can do it yourselves and we are very happy to guide you on how to do it. Um, it's just a few examples of the charts that we can produce here. We can do um, static visualizations like this. So this is a, uh, a flight path taking off from Teterborough, a particular runway from Teterborough. And each of those blue lines is a flight. It just looks cool, doesn't it? You can, you can do this with Polaris. We can also do a 3D and a 2D picture of the same thing. So this one is now at Rio, Rio de Janeiro as it flies uh, around the rock. You can see how the, the departure lanes are, are there. Maybe there's a, a noise abatement uh, procedure that you're really conscious of and maybe some of these guys are flying over noise sensitive areas uh, this is a great way of showing that you can look at touchdown points so this we used the, the geographic search here and looked at the touchdown key time instance of uh, a touchdown and these are the touchdown points on Heathrow 27 left. Quite interesting. What a wide spread there. You've got some guys on the on the on the very uh, on the piano keys at one end, and halfway down the, the runway on the other end, which is quite uh, quite interesting. We've got visualization. Two different types of visualization that are available. Um, Everybody gets this streamed in-browser visualization. 
you get a white tailed aircraft and you get a generic primary flight display and you get a play button and you can run through the whole flight backwards and forwards uh, uh, and watching the flight as it happens. It's a great tool for debriefing your pilots on a particular event. Um, squiggly lines don't mean much to, to pilots, so you can show them the, the animation, the visualization, and it will, it will trigger memories. Will, oh, I remember that now. Yeah, that's where I misset the flaps or whatever. Um, you, there's a, an optional extra we could use um, downloaded photorealistic visualization. So we use X-Plane and we can configure the cockpit to look much like your actual cockpits and color your aircraft in your company colors. Uh, and that's really nice. That's a downloaded viz that you can then run on your local machine. A few little bullet points here. So, Visualization is wonderful, it's a great bit of eye candy, and the crews love seeing it, and there are a lot of benefits to using it. So you can create this virtual 3D view. Um, it's great for debriefing, for situational awareness, um, and, and training. It's a good, great way of kind of bringing out things for training, but there are a few little things that you also need to remember when it comes uh, to visualization. It's not, a, it's not a movie of the flight, okay? This thing is only as accurate as the data coming off your aircraft. And if you think about that sample rate quantization problem that we had right at the beginning of the presentation, where Latin long can be quite crude, then we are gonna have to uh, use some smoothing techniques, okay? More smoothing techniques we use, the less realistic it actually is in a sense because it's moving further away from your recorded data. So we're, we're, we're kind of creating, creating the data. So you gotta be aware of that. It's very easy to jump to conclusions based on a 3D viz. Actually, it might not be quite as accurate as you think it is. Okay, and also, um, especially for the, for the downloaded the X-Plane viz, you're looking at this highly realistic looking cockpit and you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, that switch didn't move and that must have moved. Well, if that's not a recorded parameter, we can't animate that switch, whatever it is. You see, so it, it does rely on, on what's recorded by your aircraft. But the, the biggest thing uh, about visualization is the smiley sun. It's always nice and sunny in Google Earth land and, and X-Plane Viz land. And the reality is it could have been heavy rain, it could have been snow, it could have been middle of the night, but it looks nice and clear and, you do, and you're gonna to struggle to understand what the, what the difficulty was and the reality might be different. But I thought it was also very nice to finish my presentation on a nice smiley sun. So thank you very much for, um, for sitting through and listening to flight data monitoring principles and process. We now have five minutes to answer any questions that you may have. Anything in that that you are intrigued by? Anything you want me to explain further? Well, maybe I answered everything perfectly then. I hope I did. 
Well, you know how to get hold of me if uh, you do have questions that bubble up in your mind after this. I do have a question. Uh, how much data is stored in the QAR? Is it like the FDR 25 hours? Uh, no, it's not. Your QAR doesn't record any data itself. Um, it's limited to the card that you've got in that QAR. Um, you can go to your local PC world and buy cards uh, that will fit. Please don't ever do that. Um, you must source uh, commercial grade, high quality cards for your QAR. The QAR doesn't store any data itself, it's only those cards. If you use cheap cards, you'll just be replacing them within a week. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. That was massively informative to all of our customers that have been on the call today. We will be sharing out a recording of the presentation today. And obviously, if you have any further questions, I'm sure you have Adrian's contact details. If not, they'll be when we do the circulation of the recording. So thank you very much for um, joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the following training sessions or the safety seminar on Thursday and Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hang on. <clears throat> so event number four, um, let's see if we can work out what this would look like in real life. So we've got pitch on that top chart and we've got roll at the bottom chart. So what does that look like? Well, let's work our way through it. So the first part of the, of the graph here, it's pitch which is fairly flat. So it's zero, not doing much. And the corresponding chart in roll is not doing much. Okay, so we're, flat, we're straight and level as we enter whatever's going on here. Then the pitch comes up a little bit, but nothing too significant. But the thing that's really interesting is that massive big drop in pitch to minus 35 degrees. At the same time that's happening, we have a roll of 80 degrees. A roll of 80 degrees. So this is an extremely dramatic manoeuvre that's happening here. So we have the pitch comes up and then it comes down and we have this massive roll of 80 degrees. So I can show you what the primary flight display would have looked like. It would have looked like a normal G of 2.5. So it's a helicopter. Again, because I'm a helicopter man. And it's a helicopter that was doing a, a, a very steep uh, turn like this, up and across. Very low as well. But you look at that primary flight display there. Incredible. Well, two and a half G in that turn. Okay, one more, and then we must move on. So event number five here. So you can see from the shaded blue area and the chart at the top that this is something that happened right at the very beginning of the data. And we have a chart of rad out this time in dark green and it's at zero. So this is happening on the ground. Uh, we also have ground speed in the light green. So this chart is ground speed here. So the aircraft is taxiing, is on the ground and there's a little bit of ground speed. We have a little bit of engine information here. 
So a little bit of throttles to help us get around the corners. How do I know there are corners? Because our heading is increasing. Okay, so we're getting the picture. Aircraft on the ground, a little bit of throttles, turning corners. If we stop about here in the data, everything looks okay. From this moment to the right of the graph, the throttles go forward, the ground speed increases, but then all of a sudden the ground speed drops back down again because the throttles have dropped back down. So this is an aborted takeoff. There's still lots of turning information as well. That'll be interesting to see that on a map, which we will have a look at in a minute. But we carry on further and further to the right until we get to this point. Now this point, the throttles go forwards, but this time they stay forwards. Back at the drawing there. And the ground speed continues away and our aircraft takes off. So that's a rejected takeoff, a classic rejected takeoff there. And we can plot that onto a, onto a map. So here we are, this is the airport and we can follow our aircraft out. Started on the apron here and it taxied out and did a little bit of backtracking and did a turn, ready to start. And then the throttles went forwards and then they were quickly shut back off again and the aircraft did a turn and backtracked all the way again back to the to the, to the start of the runway and then they went for the takeoff again. So I wonder what was in the data. We can see something that would have caused this rejected takeoff and we can, we can see it. If I have a look at flaps, I put flap on the top graph there and you can see there's no flap information on this side of the graph. So they hadn't set their flaps for takeoff. Okay, so I put my flight safety officer's hat on now. I'm thinking, okay, they hadn't set flap for their takeoff. That sounds like they were rushing. They weren't going through their checklists. Cockpit resource management issue, perhaps. Um, commercial pressures, perhaps. Okay. So they're the uh, examples of the events. And now we've got to try and put all of this information together with any supplementary information that we've got. So we can draw in air safety reports uh, and, and, and other reporting, but we can also use Polaris for supporting information, for statistics. So we've got a wide range of statistics that we can create. It's easy to create, you can do it yourselves and we are very happy to guide you on how to do it. Um, it's just a few examples of the charts that we can produce here. We can do um, static visualizations like this. So this is a, uh, a flight path taking off from Teterborough, a particular runway from Teterborough and each of those blue lines is a flight. Just looks cool, doesn't it? You can you can do this with Polaris. We can also do a 3D and a 2D picture of the same thing. So this one is now at Rio, Rio de Janeiro as it flies uh, around the rock. You can see how the, the departure lanes are, are there. Maybe there's a, a noise abatement uh, procedure that you're really conscious of and maybe some of these guys are flying over noise sensitive areas. This is a great way of showing that. You can look at touchdown points. So this we used the, the geographic search here and looked at the touchdown key time instance of uh, a touchdown and these are the touchdown points on Heathrow 27 left. Quite interesting, what a wide spread there. Got some guys on a 
on the on the very uh, on the piano keys at one end and halfway down the the runway on the other end which is quite uh, quite interesting we've got visualization two different types of visualization that are available um, everybody gets this streamed in browser visualization you get a white-tailed aircraft and you get a generic primary flight display and you get a play button and you can run through the whole flight backwards and forwards uh, and watching the flight as it happens. It's a great tool for debriefing your pilots on a particular event. Um, squiggly lines don't mean much to, to pilots, so you can show them the, the animation, the visualization, and it will it will trigger memories. Will, oh, I remember that now. Yeah, that's where I misset the flaps or whatever. Um, you, there's a, an optional extra. We could use um, downloaded photorealistic visualization. So we use X plane and we can configure the cockpit to look much like your actual cockpits and color your aircraft in your company colors. Uh, and that's really nice. That's a downloaded viz that you can then run on your local machine. Few little bullet points here. So visualization is wonderful. It's a great bit of eye candy and the crews love seeing it and there are a lot of benefits to using it. So you can create this virtual 3D view. Um, it's great for debriefing, for situational awareness um, and, and training. It's a good, great way of kind of bringing out things for training. But there are a few little things that you also need to remember when it comes uh, to visualization. It's not, a, it's not a movie of the flight. Okay, this thing is only as accurate as the data coming off your aircraft. And if you think about that sample rate quantization problem that we had right at the beginning of the presentation, where Latin long can be quite crude, then we are gonna have to uh, use some smoothing techniques. Okay, the more smoothing techniques we use, the less realistic it actually is in a sense because it's moving further away from your recorded data so we're, we're, we're kind of creating creating the data so you've got to be aware of that it's very easy to jump to conclusions based on a 3d viz actually it might not be quite as accurate as you think it is okay and also um especially for the, for the downloaded X-Plane Viz, you're looking at this highly realistic looking cockpit and you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, that switch didn't move and that must have moved. Well, if that's not a recorded parameter, we can't animate that switch, whatever it is. You see, so it, it does rely on, on what's recorded by your aircraft. But the, the biggest thing uh, about visualization is the smiley sun. It's always nice and sunny in Google Earth land and, and X-Plane Viz land. And the reality is it could have been heavy rain, it could have been snow, it could have been middle of the night, but it looks nice and clear and, you and you're gonna to struggle to understand what the, what the difficulty was. And the reality might be different. But I thought it was also very nice to finish my presentation on a nice smiley sun. So thank you very much for, um, for sitting through and listening to flight data monitoring principles and process. We now have five minutes to answer any questions that you may have. Anything in that that you are intrigued by? Anything you want me to explain further?
Well, maybe I answered everything perfectly then. I hope I did. Well, you know how to get hold of me if uh, you do have questions that bubble up in your mind after this. I do have a question. Uh, how much data is stored in the QAR? Is it like the FDR 25 hours? Uh, no, it's not. Your QAR doesn't record any data itself. Um, it's limited to the card that you've got in that QAR. Um, you can go to your local PC world and buy cards uh, that will fit. Please don't ever do that. Um, you must source uh, commercial grade, high quality cards for your QAR. The QAR doesn't store any data itself, it's only those cards. If you use cheap cards, you'll just be replacing them within a week. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. That was massively informative to all of our customers that have been on the call today. We will be sharing out a recording of the presentation today. And obviously, if you have any further questions, I'm sure you have Adrian's contact details. If not, they'll be when we do the circulation of the recording. So thank you very much for um, joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the following training sessions or the safety seminar on Thursday and Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hang on.